Welcome to Designing Hollywood Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Boutet Jr. Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies and the movie industry and its talented professionals. Uh, today's guest is a Designers Guild award-winning costume designer well known for her costumes for AMC TV's Mad Men and HBO's Deadwood. Her work has been cited as influential by designers Michael Kors, Vera Wang, Prada, Mark Jacobs, and many others. After studying fashion design and moving to Paris and then New York to work in design, she moved to Los Angeles to follow her passion of pursuing a career as a Hollywood costume designer. Along with her critically acclaimed and prestigiously, award, prestigiously awarded costumes, she designed the successful Mad Men collection in collaboration with Banana Republic and has worked with many brands, including Hearts on Fire Diamonds, Downey Wrinkle Releaser, Sony, Nike, Maiden Form, and Mac Weldon. She released a book called The Fashion File with style tips and inspiration. And after working with many fashion club or working on many fashion collaborations, she found herself back in the film world, costume designing The Last Tycoon, It, The Romanoffs, Deadwood the Movie, The Old Man, and Why Women Kill. And most recently has come out with her own menswear uh, line for Inherent called Bryant Draper. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the very multi-talented Janie Bryant to Designing Hollywood podcast show. Hello, Janie. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you. Thank you. Same here. And I'm very excited to get I, what you guys need to know about Janie and something that I tell her often is the way she presents herself, her brand as a costume designer um, has been very influential and important to all of us because she represents everyone in our field so well, um, so graciously, uh, very charming, but also just with a, her design sensibilities are top notch. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you. No problem. So I start, I always like to start with the boring questions, which is how did you get started in costume design? Like how did you find yourself in this field? Uh, that's not a boring question. I, I, think that's a, I think that's a great question because everybody is like finds their path in such different ways to this career. You know, that's really interesting. I come from a really small town called Cleveland, Tennessee, and I didn't even really know that there was such a job as costume design. My mother always, always took us to the revival theaters and you know, since I was very little, I started wa watching old movies and always loved them so much. But um, I didn't really know there was somebody, you know, behind the scenes creating the costumes and creating the characters through the clothing. And um, my passion really was fashion design. And that's what I was doing from the time I was really little. Um, and also playing dress up. I mean, I remember when I was 13, my, my friend was over and I was like, let's play dress up. And she said to me, Janie, we're 13. We're way too old to play dress up. <laughs> I'm still playing dress up. Oh, so little does she know you're still doing it. Are you guys still friends now? No. I was going to say, I was wondering if she, if like now it's been one of those things was like, yeah, she plays dress up for a living now. <laughs> I was like, you're not going to be my friend anymore. No, yeah. <laughs> no but, uh, you know, that was, that was, uh, that was in my hometown of Cleveland, Tennessee, where that happened. And I just, you know, I ended up studying fashion design and moving to Paris because of fashion design and moving to New York because of fashion design. And I ended up meeting a lot of film people when I was in New York and I met, um, a costume designer at a Christmas party named Alexandra Welker. Ah. And, yes. yes. And he told me all about costume design and it was one of those aha moments of, oh my gosh, I love movies. I love television. I love, you know, but the thing that I love about it mostly is, you know, the costumes dancing across the screen. And also I loved the whole psychology of, costume design, costume designers having to get into the psychology of all these different characters and creating their clothing. And so it was really my conversation with Alexandra that changed my life forever. You know, I, and I, I thank her for that today because, um, you know, I really didn't know her. Um, it, it was just a random thing that I met her at a party. 
I love that. And it, that also, do you feel like the psychology, it's, I'm glad that you brought that up, the psychology of a costume designer in the sense of it's like not just clothing so much as it's also trying to find the core root of the character. Do you find that, or do you find that your knowledge for your fashion and all of that, when you brought that and kind of combined it together, did you like that marriage in terms of having those different thought processes kind of placed into the same place? Yes, I mean, I I love fashion. I love it. Mm -hmm. and I still love it to this day. And you know, what was really useful for me is that um, my skills that I learned in fashion design was um, pattern making, draping, you know, a lot of illustration. Um, so I, I mean, I've been sewing since I was eight, but, um, and not that any actor would want me to be sewing their costume at this <laughs> point. In but, you know, I was really happy to know those and have those skills. And also in fashion design school, um, my minor was costume history. Yeah. So, you know, it just all kind of worked together. Um, you know, my path was definitely through fashion and not going to film school or not going to having a costume design major. I really, um, I, like I said, I really didn't even know there was costume design until I met Alexandra. That's my favorite thing, actually, because like everybody in this field comes to it from a different angle, from a different perspective, or just like different walks of life. Um, and not everybody set out to do that. I know for myself specifically, just I set out to just be an illustrator at large. So I was just like, oh, maybe I'll do children's books or comic books or animation. I didn't quite know. And it was going to Comic-Con where I saw a panel of costume designers where I was like, that looks interesting. So it was the same thing where I didn't set out specifically for that. Um, but I have had the privilege of working with people like yourself over the entire course of my career to where I got to learn little bits of things here and there from each kind of designer. And I think it's a fun, it's a fun kind of collaboration in terms of thinking about uh, how people come at things from different angles and the creativity, like the fashion side. So I love when that combines back together and that aha moment of like, oh yeah, that's what I should be doing. So that's awesome. Um, do you have any, oh, go ahead. No, oh, the film business found us, Philip. When yes, I it found us. <laughs> it brought us in. It snatched us up. <laughs> do you have, um, are there any, um, what inspires you? Because a lot, like you've inspired a lot of people with your with your work. What inspires you, or what films, what genres, like what are the things you like to watch? Oh my gosh! Okay, well, I have to say, the year nineteen thirty nine is the year of film. I mean, all my favorites: uh, Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. Go with the Wind, and The Women, of course. I mean, I I just I see those movies over and over again for the costume design. I mean. I'm obsessed with Emerald City. Um, I'm obsessed with Scarlett anyway, because she was like such a feminist and Walter Plunkett, I mean, beyond. I, you know what, I was, I was privileged enough to get to go to the museum in Texas and see her green curtain velvet costume. And Walter Plunkett actually put the rooster feet on that hat. I got to see that hat. You got to see it in person, yeah. I mean, that was like, I, I mean, I, I couldn't even believe I was so lucky to see those costumes and his drawings and what, what an amazing talent. Oh my God, he's like, he's one of my favorite costume designers of all time. And the women, think about the women and like the whole fashion show, mm -hmm. and, you know, and like uh, Wizard of Oz, it's black and white film and it goes to color. And it, the fashion show is just like all in color. And then, you know, Amor, Amor. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but anyway. Oh no, I for sure. All of them, they're classics. I think it's, there was a grandness to those films. Um, what I love about them is the exact same thing. When you watch them, um, especially during the time, things were a little bit simpler too. So it feels like the artistry of costume design, even like set design production, all of it, everything felt like it was artistry working together. So it's like, it did feel like in those moments, especially in those films, costumes are at the forefront, the characters at the forefront. So it really is like showing off their best assets or like their worst at times. Um, it kind of, their love letters to costume design, you know? So it's like, it's like, I understand that completely. 
know. I mean, I, I always go back for inspiration. I always go back to the classics. I, I mean, I love an American in Paris. I love Gigi. Mm -hmm. Um, I love, you know, my, I think the first film that my mother even took us to, um, at the revival theaters was Wuthering Heights. I, I you know that that's really what inspires me. And, and I, and it's to your point, I mean, I love all the films that bring costume design to the forefront. Right. And I mean, and, and that's how I approach my work too. Um, because, and that's why costume designers are so important. And that's why pay equity is so important because like everything that the audience sees and everything that the actors feel are their costumes and the costume design. And um, anyway, I just think that costume design is everything. So yes. <laughs> no, and I'm in agreement with you. It is <laughs> with every every film especially when you think of anything the costume is often the gateway to the character it's the gateway for the audience to engage with the people that they're watching so it's like to me it's kind of a no-brainer costume design is one of the if not the most important part because it's like when you think about something you can name any iconic movie you think about you know indiana jones first thing you think about is his hat his bowl like you think about his costume right you know um so i think that it's a very important part but also i think it's one of those things that you know if done well too it's one of those things that sometimes goes by a little unnoticed because it's done so well um but it's also something where you're creating these iconic moments with these characters do you find do you find it uh, uh or do you ever take a moment to kind of sit in it and kind of like think about the fact that you were like this young girl growing up and like idealizing these these moments in costume and the way they make people feel and now you're doing that exact same thing like do you ever just kind of take in that moment like with the iconicness of your costumes because you can tell that you're approaching it that exact same way but i feel like you're doing that for a new generation of people um well thank you for saying that i think when i was little i just I mean, I just knew that I would be doing something uh, big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that was going to be, but it, it was that driving force that really got me out of, you know, that little town. Um, that is amazing. And I'm so glad that I'm from there and I was able to have that experience. And I'm glad that I'm from a small town, you know, but uh, I just always knew there was something bigger out there. I, I don't I don't know any other way to describe it. You know, it's just that something inside of you that pushes you forward into the unknown. I can only say that, you know. I love and, that theme. I love the theme that you're talking about of of knowing you knew that there was something bigger out there. Yes, I know. It's your soul talking to you. Like yeah. <laughs> right? You got to go. And, and I was just always very attracted to, uh, I guess the abnormal from like where I was in my, in my town. I mean, I, I'm sure people thought I was just like a weirdo and they, I mean, they used to call me zany Janie. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> fine. That's, you know what? I don't exactly. care. Yeah. The, that badge, the badge of honor of being called weird or special or different just means that people needed to catch up with you. And often a lot of us creatives are also called weird or something's off until it makes sense to people later. And then I just realized that, you know, we're just kind of ahead in our own kooky way. It's like, like by the time people see what it is, they're like, oh, that makes sense. You know, like now they see and they're probably like, oh, that makes sense that Janie was like that or she was into those things, you know. Yes, I mean, I was definitely a dreamer. You know, I drew all the time um, and uh, I was a ballerina and uh, I was in, you know, in the choir. And I, I just, you know, my, thankfully my mother and my parents really pushed me to do creative things, you know, whether it be like arts and crafts or uh, drawing, painting, ballet choir like all of the arts i love that and having a a, a a support network 
that actually um, helps kind of push out and kind of amplify your creativity, um, I think is really important, especially as a creative growing up is like everyone else can think you're weird. But if you've got that one person, especially if it's your parents, you've got your parents, they believe in you and they kind of put stock in saying you're creative. I'm going to push that. It's the best. It really is. It is. I know. Well, my babysitter taught me how to sew. Um, my <laughs> mom, you know, she made all of our clothing. My grandmother, she sewed um on Mad Men I used a lot of my grandmother's things that she had made and uh I was just talking about Harry Crane's suit yesterday because um he Harry Crane wore my grandfather's seersucker suit in the Derby Day episode and he totally split his pants and I was like well I'm sorry these threads are old I can't help it <laughs> <laughs> You know, Betty Draper, she wore a lot of my grandmother's aprons that she made. So, um, yes, my my family, you know, I, I, I think they they were not really creatives, but they did a lot of creative things, you know. Well, I want to I will let's transition to that a little bit because you're talking about Mad Men and Mad Men is just obviously just. Uh, a costume design feast. You literally couldn't have picked a better project for really diving into that thing we were talking about, about costume design and kind of like exploring the different avenues of it and really kind of defining characters. Um, but before we go directly into that, I want to ask you a question about because you did such a good job bringing that life to life, like you did the 60s, the 70s, and you also did um, the 30s through the last tycoon. Are there any other time periods that you that you personally hope to explore? throughout your career? Yes, oh my gosh. I really want to do the 1770s. I love French, I love the French Baroque period so mm -hmm. much. I mean, I just, I have a dream to live at Palace Versailles if I could. That's where I would like to live for the rest of my life. I, I would join you. I remember being, we, um, we <laughs> took a tour and we got to Versailles and we kind of turned around that corner and we're walking up to it and it's like looks like a mirage it's just this beautiful grand space and walking through it I think the thing that I was most impressed by is it felt like you can tell it's decadent and like just like over designed in the best way but it let it felt like nothing was put there without having an artist touch it like the paintings on the walls the doorknobs the furniture the fabric like the curtains it felt like no matter what like it felt like everything was like there was an artist like oh you need a chair let me make it you need a thing like you need some teacups like let me make it felt like everything like design overload where i was really overwhelmed in the best possible way so doing costumes in that period would be fun <laughs> Philip, come live there with me. There's I will. <laughs> we can be fancy together. It'd be awesome. <laughs> fancy is my favorite thing. And that's why I love that period. I'm obsessed. And so I would really love to design um, a, a TV show or a movie set in that period. I, I, I love the 1970s too, but uh, you know, for different reasons for like crazy polyester, but you know, the 1770s, oh, it's a dream. It's a dream, but we'll see. We'll see. Somebody's got to write it, right? Somebody had to write it and then do it, or, or maybe just do an art house, an out house, an out house, an out, ah, <laughs> art house film. I don't know why I couldn't say that. An art house film, um, which is where you just, just costumes fully on display. As long as they have enough money, I'm down with that. Yeah, completely. <laughs> so I was like, I need to do that film, right? <laughs> completely. <laughs> well, I was going to say, each time a new episode of Mad Men, it, Mad Men aired, um, I was equally excited about the fashion as I was the storyline, because the storylines were incredible, um, diving into these characters, and then even just the relationships of how people treated each other back then, and like all the politics and all of that. Um, was there a character specifically that you really enjoyed dressing on that? Then? Yes. Oh, well, you know what, I wanted to bring something up, because you were talking about <laughs> early, of like the, um, you know, the amazing, uh, the amazing thing about costume design and how we see characters. And I was thinking about like, when you said Indiana Jones, I was thinking about Superman, you know, you see his cape, you see his costume, um, Breakfast at Tiffany's, you mm -hmm. see the black hat and the white pearls and the Givenchy dress. And, you know, like every time you think about Breakfast at Tiffany's, you think about Audrey Hepburn in that cost costume. Correct. 
when you think about Don Draper, you think about him and his gray suit, right? Correct. Those things like go together. So I really, I really love that that show and the costume design were able to create kind of like that iconic character. Mm -hmm. uh, so I love that. And plus I love John Hamm. I love designing suits for him. I mean, he's, he's a riot. He really is like the funniest man. <laughs> he is, it, which is great because his character is, not, is so dark in the show, but right. really in real life, John is, uh, he's got a great sense of humor. That's awesome. And, and uh, so I loved that. I loved creating, helping to tell that story of that character through the costume design. And, uh, and of course, I mean, January Jones, Betty Draper. Literally Betty. do no wrong. She could wear everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know sometimes I would just cry when she would come out like fully dressed, all hair and makeup and uh, she would, January would always laugh at me because it was such an emotional thing, kind of like to see it all put together and just how, you know, beautiful she is. Um, and of course, I love Megan Draper. I guess I'd love all the Draper wives, right? right. Yes, all of it, yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's speaking to my, my heart of fashion, the, you know, the wives. So um, I, I, I love, I love them. You know what it is? It's the, um, like, because continuing on that theme, what it did, which I didn't realize it was actually doing at the time, was there's that thing when we talk about iconic characters, right? And you think about, like, the pearls, or you think about even just uh, 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 a Sunday evening drive in a convertible with the, the like, the glasses and the scarf on. It's, it, those moments are iconic, in a, but they're not just iconic, they're powerful. What they do to people is like, if you ever decided that you were going to do that, like you say, I just got a convertible and you wanna do something where you just, you're living it up. Like, it's like you go and you do that thing. So you put your glasses on and you put your scarf and you drive down Hollywood Boulevard or wherever you are, it brings people joy, like actual joy in their real life, right? Like, or it makes them feel powerful. Or like, if you put on a good suit and you go to your interview, you feel like you're in charge or in control. And I think that that's what those moments were. A lot of them, the ones that you created in the show, just even just something as basic as looking your best to cook dinner. Like just, it's a, it's a moment that people I think can palpably feel, feel and then they replicate it in their life, in real life. I think I think that's why I, I'm I always kind of go against the trend of not getting dressed because it's like you know you you truly when you put on clothing that makes you feel good it is it is about creating joy in your life it is about projecting the image that you or I should say the image that you want to project mm -hmm. clothing really does make help you feel great, better, joy, you know, like your, your energy just changes. So I, I, I will talk about this a little bit later, but just the importance of mental health and clothing and like what clothing can do for you. And, and I think that's why like movies, television, and when you see great costume design and you have a visual joyful experience you know the audience does and also that the actor feels like they are encompassing a character um I mean that's that's everything isn't it I mean that's why we do what we do I mean that's when I think at some point I had heard you talk about even like the shapewear of that time period and how it made women carry themselves differently or like what it makes you feel um and I thought that that was really inspiring too, because you're right, if you get those details right, it's just the way you move, like the actors, the way they move, the way they talk, like everything is inspired by that. Um, and I think that honestly, that's one of the questions I was gonna ask you is like, in terms of resonating with like, like the audience or even some people that like may have like not watched the show, but just seen pictures of it. Um, I think that part of your power in kind of controlling that narrative and making sure that it resonated with people were those details. I think that they can feel them even if they don't understand what they're feeling. Yeah. And, and I mean, the girdles, yes. I mean, <laughs> the, whole thing, the whole thing is about the girdles is that 
I mean, I still su support girdle wearing. I still do. Uh, <laughs> but, the, you know, the thing is with the girdle is for the actresses, I really wanted them to get into the habit and just having the experience of what women went through at that time. And for us not really to take any shortcuts in, in that um, way, because that is the foundation of their costume that is the foundation of their character because those women's those women would be wearing girdles they would be wearing stockings they would be wearing long line bras they would be wearing the slip and so I, I always say that you know my superpower is time travel and so it's really important for the actors to um, go back in time too and experience all those elements of what was underneath the costume and like not only what, you know, we see on the outside on the screen. I was gonna ask you too, while you're talking about that in terms of one of the things that I noticed watching Mad Men, which was really interesting in terms of how you dress the women specifically is because the time period was different and men and women treated each other much differently than, than they do now, um, at least in terms of like, you know, fighting for like equal rights and all of those things, you managed to make the women still come off they felt powerful. Like, how did you how did you approach that, or at least trying to give them? Because sometimes, obviously, there's moments where they're not. But how did you approach thinking about uh, kind of furthering along, like making sure that they felt like they could stand on their own two feet in a time period that often kind of tried to like repress them or shut them down? Well, I mean, I think that that was the writing of Matthew Weiner, really. Um, I mean, he is such a beautiful writer, creator showrunner. I mean, he is such uh, a, an amazing man, you know, that was truly inspirational to me. For eight years, we worked together, you know, and, and he, he himself was so passionate about the female characters that um, it inspired me. And I, and I think a big part of that is the color palettes for the female characters. I mean, like Joan, I mean, one of the things that I loved about Joan, um, Christina Hendricks, who will be forever known as Joan, which I love and uh, what a great character. And so for me, like I loved the idea that she would have this really strong uh, color palette. Yeah. So it was always in those like really strong, powerful jewel tones. And um, I mean, maybe some people don't, like that I think this or say this, but like the great thing about Joan is that she did embrace her femininity. Right. She understood her uh, power of femininity. She understood how to um, talk to men, you know, mm -hmm. and it blew her femininity. I mean, you know, it's like, if you're, if you're, uh, she just, well, Anyway, I won't, I won't share all my views on that. I, no, but listen, I, under, I, under, I understand what you're trying to say or what you're getting at, which is it was specific. She knew what to do to get the job done. She knew how to use you to use it. Yeah. You attract more bees with honey than you do with bees. <laughs> There's that Southern charm. That's the best way to say that. <laughs> Especially when it comes to men, right? I mean, I right. don't use your feminine wiles honey it's like what are you doing that and I said I just always felt like Joan like I just I loved that she just used all of her femininity to get what she wanted you know and that was through like bust waist hips full mm -hmm. tones I mean I, I just I loved that she used her sexuality in a powerful way I mean and that's a part of that was that character and it really leaning into that is awesome that's a character design all in itself. Exactly. And think about Marilyn Monroe. I mean, like exactly. Marilyn Monroe was a huge inspiration to me for Joan. And, and she's still an inspiration for me today. Uh, you know, I was just reading about like how she created that, uh, Marilyn Monroe, how she created that breathy mm -hmm. speaking. And it wasn't through, um, it wasn't through like trying to seduce men, although it did, it was really because she had a really bad stutter. And so it was the only way that she could speak and, and like that right. stutter. 
And I was like, oh God, I just, I love that idea that, you know, she used that for her advantage, you know, but Joan, but Joan was very much about that too. And, and I love that that character just knew how to work that femininity and how strong she was. And really that like the color palette, it was all about the color palette for me, for Joan. And when, and when in the moments when she was, um, not as strong or like something in the script that was happening where she was having dark moments. Like I would change the color palette for her too. That's so. a, I love that. I, I was going to say, well, I was going to say also too, you, it sounds to me like what you just said here is you did a lot of research too, like just like even psychological research to put that back into the clothing. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, that is the fun part, isn't it? Like, um, okay, you're going to love this example. So for Peggy, mm -hmm. In my mind, she was always kind of like this earnest school girl. And so for me, that was like checks and plaids and very kind of like geometrical patterns. Mm. So, you know, Peggy wears the checks and plaids throughout all the seasons, regardless of where she is in her career. It's just like who she is and like what those fabrics say to do the about the character and to the audience. I love that. I mean, and that's kind of like, that's the fun part of the play. What I've loved, if you guys are paying attention to what Janie has just said in terms of even just thinking about the character, she's picking moments or psychological parts are parts of the character and then expressing them through the costume in a way that either is subliminal or through color palette or whatever it is. But there's also the research of the character. So she's also studying the shape language, um, the entire part of how they carry themselves and then placing it back in there. Um, I think that that's probably just like one of the biggest lessons I've learned from costume design in general is really starting from the inside out and then figuring out like, is the character wearing the costume? Is the costume wearing them? Are they in control? Are they not in control? Like, are they making this choice? Or is it a character arc choice where this character was super depressed at the beginning of the story? So they're in dark, like muted colors. And by the end of the story, they're vibrant and full of life and over the top. Like, I think that that's kind of what it is. And we got to see so many of those um, moments and elements in your costume design for Mad Men. So just again, thank you. It was so great. Uh, such a good journey, but also it was fun watching you play, play in the world. Yeah. You know, so much fun. I, you know, it's like uh, when I was in Paris uh, designing Romanovs, mm -hmm. we did the first episode of the Romanovs in Paris and oh my God, what a dream. I got to live at the Park Hyatt for six Oh, years. wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god this dream has come true I mean we were right down the street from the Ritz Carlton and the Louvre and the gardens the Tuileries gardens I got to go to the Dior show oh which, nice you no know, like it was a dream I felt I mean I felt like wait what's the little girls uh what is the Matilda yeah. <laughs> Matilda <laughs> But, you know, I re-watched Mad Men uh, during that time. And, uh, and, and you know, it was, it was amazing because Matthew Weiner, he, you know, was also the creator of the Romanovs. And so, yes. you know, like, I, I, I was inspired to just re-watch episodes of Mad Men while, while I was in Paris when I had a little downtime. And, uh, oh, my gosh, I just, I, I love seeing that show over and over and over again. I mean, it really is. I mean, I think the best TV show ever created um, and not because of the costume design, no, but sure. just, just everything that that show did for design um, and also character and just how those characters are written and their stories. And it's so layered. It's so layered. And, you know, it's like when you're designing a show, it's like if you're painting and drawing, you know, you have to step back as an artist and yep. have some time, some distance to really appreciate. And so, you know, when I was in the years of designing Mad Men, I mean, I think there were a lot of moments that I couldn't really fully appreciate, you know? Right. Um, but now when I look back on it and just having perspective of all the things that, you know, that my team and I did, 
all of the incredible moments that that I was able to enjoy just career wise too. Mm -hmm. And all the people that, you know, we got to meet. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's amazing. It's an amazing experience. And I think you really encapsulated a bunch of different things. You were even bringing up the, the correlation of kind of art and all of those things in illustration. One of the things that I love the most about the sixties in terms of time period is the power uh, or the, um, the power that ad like ad agencies had in the sense that like illustration was massive then there wasn't photography hadn't quite taken over so you had like full like illustrators were like it was like a thing like it was an actual thing and i i just enjoy that period but then i also the inspiration i found and it was like not only are the illustrators here kind of like in like a focus a focal point where it's like they're the ones that are selling with the ads and everything else but then they're also dressed so amazing. like it made me want to dress up to go to work like it, it really did <laughs> yeah. i was like get dressed up you will feel better it made me do it <laughs> um i will say you're a great dresser you have oh. great Thank you very much. That's probably based off of some of the stuff I watched there and feeling inspired to actually kind of put my best foot forward. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I've seen a Western costume. It's some amazing outfits. <laughs> thank you very much. I try. Always impressed. Yeah. <laughs> my other question I had for you, because I want to transition. You're also not, you did Why Woman Kill. And you, um, I wanted to find out if your all of the influences and the the research you've done a ton of research for your, the '60s era. Did that help inspire you or help inform how you started to approach why women kill, in terms of like thought process of design? Well, the first season uh, of Why Women Kill, you know, was three periods: the early 1960s, the 1980s, and the uh, 2017. And um, the, you know, the 19, early 1960s, which stars Jennifer Goodwin and Sam Yeager and Alicia Coppola Jones. I mean, it was so fun to design that period because it was kind of going back to Mad Men days, but the characters were so different. So I really wanted to approach it differently. And just the tone of how Mark Cherry writes anyway is very different. So. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it takes place in Pasadena, not in New York. Mm -hmm. So the feel, the colors, the the mood was you know completely different. So it was, even though I was familiar, I'm very familiar with the 1960s. Mm -hmm. It was still creating all new characters, right. all all new different you know styles. And uh, if you'll notice too, what I loved about. Uh, Jennifer Goodwin's Jenny's character in the beginning, you know, she's all in like celeries and grays and drab, drab, drab. And then she has this character arc of like coming to life and she's like a blooming flower. And so her costume design changes from like drab, celery, beige to like beautiful, strong, bright prints and florals and bright 60s colors so i mean i love doing a costume design art honey i love it, <laughs> just, it was so fun and then and then with lucy lou's character you mm -hmm. know she kind of has the opposite storyline she goes from like in the 80s everything being bright colorful big bold big shoulders ruffles frills the opulence of like this, the grandeur of the house. And I mean, you can tell she was my spirit animal. Yes. <laughs> yes. Alice Versailles, let's go. <laughs> so, but she, after having this experience with her husband who has AIDS and she comes into the knowledge of like really what's important in life, which is love and just being comfortable in your own self. And so, with the color palette, I went uh, from like bright to like very subdued, subdued. understated. Um, and so I, I, you know, I love playing with all of those color elements and just having, you know, your feeling changes, like the actors feeling changes and their performance can be enhanced by that. And also the audience, even if they're not really paying attention or not really noticing 
they can feel those changes too. It's like you have a vibrational visual change. One thing I want to point out too, if you guys are thinking about it in terms of something else she just brought up, which is the, when we're talking about character arcs and how she's kind of doing this color palette thing, oftentimes when you when you don't get to see the work, especially as classroom designers are working like, you know, long hours, they're working a lot, they're pulling references, they're doing mood boards, there's all these different things, right? And then researching, looking in books and all of that. Um, the color palette thing is always interesting to me because sometimes depending on if you have the scripts or if you have the story and you know the arc or where you're going, um, you'll see like Janie might have a whole fabric swatch that goes from behind her desk and it's like the drab colors all the way to the very end or there'll be or like if you get to see a fitting of the costumes there you see them on the rack and they're going in order of color palette like it's a, just a cool thing the experience that I've seen through, throughout the course of my career in terms of like you get to see that character in that moment through the costume designer's eyes in a fitting or in a in a way to where you can really see that they not only think about the character for this episode, but their entire kind of like lifespan of what we're looking at, or if the show is long, it just continues on and they grow as they go along. Um, but I just have always found that really interesting because it's like something that people don't get to see, you know, unless it's a behind the scenes, they don't get to see the process of costume design and how thought thoughtful it is. Um, so I'm glad that you brought up that fact because sometimes it might be, even if it's like a film fitting, you might only have that main actress for that one fitting and you got to get everything in. Um, and I've seen that happen before me. And then at the end, the actress leaves and I'm looking at the rack of clothes and it's all in order from like, she was depressed now, but now she's happy. It's just a cool thing. Um, it's a cool thing to see for sure. It, well, this past season with uh, Why Women Kill season two, mm -hmm. Uh, the finale was just on um, on Thursday, but you can still see it on Paramount Plus because watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, why women kill? Watch it. <laughs> and of course, you know it's March Cherry, so it's totally quirky and it's so uh, it's so great to watch a show that is just like fun and light and it's quirky and it's 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 also like so much fashion that mm -hmm. you know season two takes place in 1949 uh which is dior you know the the new look came out in 1947 so right. so much of it is in you know inspired by the new look of dior and uh but i love the two main characters the two female characters uh lana, lana Perea and allison tolman and they have this incredible arc where they change places essentially. Mm -hmm. so it was really challenging and interesting to kind of like start Alma off as a very drab doll housewife. And then uh, Lana's character, Rita, she's all in like reds and mm -hmm. fashion and bright and black and white. And they have this total character change where they switch places and so I all of their costumes uh, by the end I was designing costumes for uh, Rita that were beige and browns and uh, Allison Tolman who plays Alma bright reds anyway I won't tell you what happens but yes <laughs> black and white bright reds you know these bright everything in her costume has a, if there's an element of uh, roses, red roses, because, um, well, she's, she's a killer. So, uh, you. there was lots of good textures in there too, with what your fabric choices were. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to say, do you have, um, with having such like, you know, like the focus be on these female characters, um, was, was there any kind of like, themes that you tried to tie into, you know, throughout each female lead, were there themes that you were really focused on that you were trying to kind of like weave into that besides the color palette? Weave into that? Yeah, like, were you trying to like kind of, hey, yeah, there you go, see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> Your pun, I like it. <laughs> you know, um, the garden ladies, I mean, the garden ladies, I really wanted them to be very fashion focused. And so very much of that Dior silhouette. I mean, you know, we did the corsetry, the petticoats, we did it all. 
Um, but as far as like character stuff of, of really um, implementing character, I, from with Alma, at every opportunity, I would try to do like a flower, like a flower motif for her the whole time because she was trying to get into this garden club and gardening was her passion. So once she started having like the little seedlings of kind of like waking up, I would start uh, like using fabrics with like little tiny flowers to the end of using big roses. And you can see that in Rita's costume design too, because she is the president of this garden club. And so everything is about flowers. Everything is about roses. And oh, what I had just had, I just had the best time this season. I really did because it was just everything so beautiful and feminine. And I just, I loved it. I loved it. I love how you keep finding jobs to where you're getting jobs to where they really play to your strengths, but things that you love that also challenge you. I think that that's a nice niche that you found for yourself that sometimes we often don't get, which is people recognizing the talent that you have and then making sure that they're hiring you to kind of like utilize it to the best of its ability and then you have these great storylines but then it's also about featuring the clothing um so i think it's just great that you keep finding yourself in that pocket and then get getting to explore a costume to its full you know capacity thank you i know i i feel so blessed i'm so lucky i truly am you know now i'm working on this show called 1883 set mm -hmm. in 1883 and um it's the prequel to Yellowstone. Oh, and that sounds awesome. It's so great. I'm like, oh my God, I'm really living the dream. It's so fun because I, you know, I'm obsessed with menswear too. And, um, you know, my, my love of menswear really started when I started designing Deadwood uh, because, you know, it was almost a full male cast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I, I really started experimenting with the Victorian era with Deadwood and also kind of developing my love and knowledge of, of menswear of that, of that period. But, um, you know, like, you know, one, one thing that we were kind of talking about before we started recording, mm -hmm. some people were asking me about, you know, I, before I got hired to design Deadwood, I was on my way out of the film business Wow. So what was going on there? I didn't know that. And I was, I was like, uh, I'm so over costume design. I'm so <laughs> over. I'm so over like designing these contemporary shows, you know, like yeah. it just yeah. my heart and soul of like where I wanted to be right. natively, you know. So I was working on um, photography. I was working on designing accessories. Mm -hmm. I was working on designing uh, dog clothing. <laughs> That's awesome. At the time, you know what? And I look back on that, I'm like, I really should have stuck with that because I would have been a gazillionaire. I mean, I mean, completely. Still, you can, you know what? You can still go back and do it now. I know it's never too late, Philip. Yeah. Right? <laughs> matter like that is the life lesson it's never too late for anything so yes thank you for saying mm -hmm. that but I, <laughs> I had two little toy poodles at the time and uh, I was designing clothes for them and I was like I'm gonna start my own business in in uh dog clothing I can I can like do ruffles I can do bells I can do cashmere sweaters I can do anything I want to do and so um uh I know, and I had made like this three layer tutu skirt for my little toy poodle autumn. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and my boyfriend at the time was like, oh, that is so weird. That's crazy. I'm like, you know what? Anytime says you're crazy, you know it's, you're on the right You're path. on the right path, exactly. <laughs> for us all, right? So, and so David Milch called me and he said, Janie, I'm going to be doing this show called Deadwood. It's 1870s. Mm. And I had just really been putting it out into the universe of like, I just, I want to design a period show. I want to design a period show. And, you know, bless his heart, he hired me, it came back to me and um, I did not end up leaving the film business. <laughs> so yes, it, it, it brought me home again. Yeah. I love stories like that because people need to hear them. You need to hear that not everything that ends up happening because we get to see 
especially like online and stuff, we see the triumphs everyone has, but we never see the point where you're like crying in a corner or you're just like completely stressed out and you need to walk away or you decide, you know what, for whatever reason, this just isn't working for me or this job is way more stressful. One thing that people forget too, or at least miss in terms of even just costume design is costume designers aren't just doing what Jamie, we've, what we've been talking about. They're not just sitting and designing. That's the fun part. They're also managing their crew and they're going to meetings and they're talking to producers and writers and directors. And then they have to deal with actors having a meltdown. You know, like there's so many different things that happen that go into it that you can get to a point where you're like, did I make the right choice? Or do I want to do this? Or do I want to go and design dog's clothes? Like I have gone through that same serious, like I've gone through that period myself where I almost stopped working. And I think it was through, I think working on Captain America, the first Captain America movie was the time where I saw artists, it was a uh, artist, Ryan Minerding and Charlie Wynn, and they were uh, like big time concept artists. Um, they're in are huge now, um, but they're, watching them paint and draw reinvigorated my like love of design like where I was because I was like I was kind of like but did I make the right choice is this what I want to do and then once I saw that I was like yeah this is what I want to do and it kind of set me back it like was like a shift it set me back on track because otherwise I was like yeah I think I'm gonna go do animation or do some kids books or so I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do but I was like I don't know if this is right for me until I saw that and then reinvigorating with the art career side then helped me connect with designers also in a different way too uh with costume designers and working back and forth where i was like okay now i understand this um and then i was lucky enough along the way to have mentors or designers like michael kaplan or jeffrey curland and like all these people where i learned little bits of design or like thought process from them that kind of kept me going but there's always that point guys where you just get to a point where you're like no i think i'm over it <laughs> No, I don't think that's what I want to do. So it's good to hear that. I'm glad you shared that. Oh my gosh, no. I mean, I've had heartbreaking disappointments, you know, throughout my career. Devastating, yeah. you know, um, whether it be from like jobs that I didn't get or, you know, people on my team betraying me, you, you know, I mean, there's just like, there's so many uh, things that you go through, you know, of, of ups and downs. And I think, I think the thing is like, if you love it, if you're passionate about it, you just have to move forward, you know, and, and think about sort of like the bigger goal as opposed to the minutia of like what can happen to you through a course of a show or through a course of life or, you know what I mean? It's like, you just have to keep going. I, I don't know. I don't really see any other way out. Just keep on going, you Just know? Just keep going. I think it's also important to mentally, like, it's important to do what you did, though, which is it's important also to try different things and try and explore other avenues because we do get burned out. Even if we're switching time periods or genres, it's like one day I'm doing some super sci fi thing and the next day I'm doing, you know, like a, a, a woman in an evening gown going to a fancy dinner like you need a break. So having palate cleansers or things that you enjoy or things that are like slightly outside is also super healthy. Um, and you had brought it up earlier. Can you talk a little bit of when you were talking about like the mental health and like kind of like mental health versus costume and how you. You know, it's so interesting in that area. I was, yesterday, I just flew back from Colorado Springs mm -hmm. because I was uh, invited to go do two menswear events with um, my collection, Inherit. Yes. Uh, InheritClothier.com. I've done a collection called Bryant Draper. Yes. And, uh, it's, it's really interesting because their kind of like DNA of the company is about mental health and yeah. dressing well. So, um, you know, those two things really do speak to me passionately. So, I was there um, hosting two events with Inherit um, on Friday night and on Saturday. And, you know, a, a lot of those conversations were about like getting dressed and feeling great and how powerful getting dressed up can really change your life for the better. And you can feel better about yourself. You can present yourself to the world in a better way if you just take that time to get dressed and, and look your best. 
um, I mean, that was definitely, you know, values that I was brought up with because my dad, you know, he always said to me, Janie, take pride in your appearance. Mm. And, and, you know, it's like he wasn't really saying take pride in your appearance because it's going to make you feel better. But that's really what he meant. Yes. Because and I think that that's such an important thing to remember, especially in these times of Zooming and people not taking care of themselves. And, you know, for me, and I guess that's why people always say like, oh, you're so dressed up. <laughs> if I don't get dressed up, I'm going to feel bad about myself. <laughs> to take the time to like put on pretty clothes, do my hair and makeup wear my high heels and like that's how I feel my best and and I loved talking to a group of men about menswear about the Bryant Draper collection about like how important it is to wear clothes that make you feel great because it's so important for your mental health um and and you know and it's so exciting because like designing this collection um, John Hamm has um, my favorite jacket, the Bogart. Um, Matt, Matt Bomer has the Bogart. It's like this gorgeous ivory dinner jacket, double-breasted that Taylor and I designed. Uh, Jeff Bridges has my uh, Bonnie Blue linen sport coat that is beyond gorgeous. Uh -huh. And uh, Matthew D'Addario has the green double-breasted linen suit that we did and uh anyway i'm just like it's so amazing that these guys like have you know these pieces of the collection it's mm -hmm. it's really, I, I feel so thankful i do where yeah. did where where did the inception of it come from or when did you start thinking about oh my gosh you're gonna love this so i had uh i had driven to tennessee mm -hmm at the pandemic it was so crazy it was just to like share a historical moment um my best friend had said come to the black lives matters uh protest at the pan pacific park which is like five minutes down from my house i was like okay i've just gone to the grocery store i'm gonna put the food away i'm heading over there and uh and she called me and she said you know, it's, it's feeling like a little weird here. People aren't wearing their masks. I'm getting just a little nervous. I mean, this was like, people yeah. were really scared, right? Yes. I think I'm going to go back. And I said, okay, well, I really want to meet you there. She's like, I know, but I'm going to, I'm going to leave. And so she called again five minutes later. And she was like, Janie, there's this like weird traffic going on. I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it's like the police had come out and they were, you know, spraying yeah. people smoke bombing people. It was so scary. I was yeah. like, what the heck is happening? Right. Right. And then like that night it was helicopters and police alarm, mm -hmm. police sirens and gunshots. And I called my mom. I was like, mom, I'm going to hop in the car. I've just gone to the grocery store. I'm driving to Tennessee. And she said, okay. I was like, I'll see you in three days. So I got in my car. I took my poodle Valley, you know, mm -hmm. my Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> my, my dream. And so we packed up and we drove cross for three days. I listened to Elvis for three days straight. I mean, I only listened to Elvis anyway, but yeah. <laughs> three days in the car and I was sitting in Tennessee with my family, sweating it out because, you know, it was really hot, really muggy, which I love. But I, you know, my agent called and she said, Hey, um, I just got, I just saw this new menswear brand. It's called Inherit Clothier. And the CEO's last name is Draper. She said, you should do a Draper suit. I was like, maybe I should do, let's call them. I want to do a menswear collection with them. And so she was like, great, I'll call them. And, um, and she called them, we had a Zoom, we totally connected on uh, mental health and the importance of how dressing well really does help with mental health and make you feel better about yourself. And yeah. so Taylor Draper, uh -huh. the CEO, he said, let's do a menswear collection together. And, you know, it was just one of those like little miracle things that happened during the pandemic that 
I was asked to do this collection with with uh, with this company, this amazing company, and um, that's how it kind of started. And I was like, wow, like it's amazing how like there were so many blessings during the pandemic. Really, you know, I got to spend a lot of time with my family, three months with my family. It mm-hmm. was incredible, and to be able to design this collection with with Taylor Draper and to really have a dream come true because I love menswear. I right, mean, right. I love menswear. <laughs> like, and I love making men feel great about themselves and like feel great in their clothes. So anyway, that was a very long story to say like how oh. to do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good though. Cause it's good to hear the inception of it. And I like how it all kind of came about in the thought process. One of my favorite things about quarantine has been how things slowed down, how it felt like this pocket of time. There was a, a, a great moment in there where, um, you know, I'm an 80s kid, so I feel like I had this transition to where there was no internet and then there was internet. There was, you know, things that were like slow and then all of a sudden technology boom, right? So it's like computers and games and all that. And I think that for a time, even for just a brief time, for like a few months, it felt slower, like it felt like before cell phones, before technology, before like even internet, it felt like that moment where it's like, if you called someone, they would call you back a couple of days later and that was fine. Like, it wasn't like, where are they? Let me send them a, you know, a text and then an email and then, you know, a messenger pigeon is like, I need to talk to them right now. It felt slower. Um, So it allowed everybody to really focus on things that matter, like family, um, reconnecting with the things that you personally like, your mental health, all of those things. Um, So I really enjoyed that part, but it also birthed a lot of creativity, right? So it birthed this fashion line of you having the time to not be stressed, to think about it and say, what's important about that? Um, So I appreciated that um, aspect of it. And what you're saying is completely true is there was a point where I started to realize, I was like, you know what? Like I actually wanna start thinking about what I wear, thinking about the way that I dress. And I found that I carried myself different or even just like, I love wearing hats. So I started wearing hats and I was fine. Like people would open the door for me and be like, oh, hello, sir. And I'm like, sir, like, I'm like, what? Like, what? what's this, you know? Um, so I kind of enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoy that aspect a lot. So it started to make me think about stuff. And then I started thinking about grooming and I started thinking about all these different things that you do. And it's not so much even that you're trying to put something on. It just makes you feel good about yourself and it makes you carry yourself differently. And it also infects other people. They start wanting to do the same thing or they want to, you know, dress up or they want to feel a certain kind of way. Um, and it's something that you can't can't really put your finger on so a menswear line in that vein and I love that you were thinking about that is awesome it's so great I know I think my team they you know my my team that uh, we're together now and we were together on why women kill as well and uh so they know that I I do believe in the value of dressing up so I always appreciate them because they always they always dress up too <laughs> there was one point where I remember learning about dressing up from um, it was Jeffrey Curland. We were working on Inception, and I got to the point where I like so I'm like younger at this point. Like this is like the very beginning of my career for the most part, and I think I had just gotten to this point where I was just like bummy. Like I was working at uh, Hargate. We were at Bill Hargate Costumes. And so I was starting to get really comfortable. And one day I just showed up. I think I had like sweats and flip flops on and like a tank top or something. And Jeffrey, yeah, no. And Jeffrey, Jeffrey looked like I didn't think anything of it. I just came into work and I'm sitting at my desk drawing and I came to talk to him about something. He kind of looked, it was him and uh, uh, he's a costume designer now, it was Terry Anderson. And Terry was the assistant and Terry was just like, oh, is it laundry day? And I took me a while and I was like, no, it was, it was, it was the best. We laughed for like a good 15 minutes. And I was like, yeah, I guess I kind of just stopped caring. (laughs) You know, like it was kind of like, they're like, hey man, like they weren't saying anything about it. They're just like, you know, present yourself. And so I thought about it after that point, but it was like when I learned that lesson, like I was like, hey, you know, we're not saying you got to come to work in a suit, but you still got to kind of pull it together, you know? (laughs) I didn't see you that day. <laughs> you would have like, given me a hard time for sure. I looked like I had just rolled out of bed at college. Like, hey guys, what's going on? You know. <laughs> Sweet, but yes, I would have given you a hard time. <laughs> it's 
especially because I know you have such great style. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I've, I've, I've progressed, but definitely during that time period, I was like, I don't know, like I just kind of, I needed to learn that lesson, um, but I've learned it and now I've understood the power that clothing possesses. So I think that that's something that you have definitely given me as well. So thank you for that. Um, we're coming to a close, so I want, I do want to ask, um, just in terms of inspiring the, the next generation, is there anything that you would like to impart on them or tell them as far as training or like, if they're, if we have people that are wanting to get into costume, like what are some gems that you can give them or things that you've learned? Well, you know, I think the most important thing is don't take no for an answer. I think and you just, like we were talking about before, you really have to push forward, push through, uh, believe in yourself. I think it's really important to practice uh, manifestations. And I, I truly believe in meditation and just spending that like first five minutes of like every day focusing on the things that you want and speak the language of the things that you want, not ever what you don't want. That's a huge life rule. Don't ever say the things that you don't want. Always say the things that you want. It, it's amazing, like the gifts that you will receive by speaking that language and thinking those thoughts always of like, think what you want, manifest that, manifest those dreams. It's so important. And, you know, I read something the other day and it was something like, be in awe of the masterpiece that you are. And I think it's so important for all of us to really appreciate all of our gifts, all of the things that we can contribute to this world and to do that in a positive way. And I think with costume design, that is such a great message because people get worried about being freelance, about where's the next job gonna come again? Focus on the things that you want. Keep that course, stay that path. It will come to you. It was, I'll tell you a little story about my intern. Uh, her name is Christina LeClaire and she was my intern. Uh, my agent had connected me with her because she was graduating from SCAD in Savannah. And um, she, uh, she was, she was like going to be my intern for the summer of uh, 2020. It was pandemic. And she was so great at it that I was like, hey, I'm getting ready to uh, design the show called Why Women Kill. It's the second season. Would you want to come on and be my PA? Do you have in any interest in like packing up your life, coming out west? And she was like, yeah, I guess so. Yes, of course. Yes, I want to do that. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, she and I met just in this very organic way and I just loved her so much and she has such a great uh, outlook on life and like super positive and just such, uh, like has such a great work ethic. And, you know, she is still my, she's my production assistant still. She was my production assistant on Why Women Kill. And now she's my production assistant on 1883. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm very supportive. She wants to be an illustrator. Okay. Uh, and I'm very supportive of her, like, you know, talking to her about getting into the union mm -hmm. and, you know, my, the point of the story is that it just like, keep, you know, a positive attitude and be focused on the things that you want and go full speed ahead. That's a that's good, that's, that's good advice. And ultimately the manifestation thing is, so I want you guys all listening or, or watching to pay attention to the fact that she's talking about manifestation. Your mind is powerful. And so you don't want to use it or waste it thinking negative thoughts or thinking about what you can't do. I've found even in, uh, in health, in sickness, Oftentimes people will get better just by believing they will get better or believing that they can. It's when you give up or when you break down that your body just seems to shut down. And I do feel like we're in control. And even if we don't know it to a certain degree, there's something about the mind being the thing that, you know, works your entire body that it really does 
behoove you to try to stay positive because it's like that's your that's your strength it's like your fortitude and saying what you want and going for it out loud there's nothing wrong with that and I think ultimately hard work to me hard work always pays off it may not pay off in the way that you wanted but it never not pays off it may pay off 10 years from now but if you put in the work and you stay focused it will happen you know yeah and and enjoy the journey and and stay focused on the things that you do want you know but one thing you do have control of is the thoughts that you think and so thoughts become things and so whether you know it or not you're creating all the time by what you're thinking so if you choose to think good thoughts I mean you just feel better anyway it's very true (laughs) right (laughs) Well, thank you, Janie. I want I want you to tell everybody where can they follow you on social media or where can we see more from you? Um, well, I have two Instagrams. Um, one is at Janie Bryant, which is kind of like a mixture of like my personal and, and a little bit of work too. Mm-hmm. And then uh, my costume designer, Janie Bryant, is also on Instagram. Okay. Uh, you can pretty much find me anywhere under Janie Bryant. Yes, and- correct. <laughs> follow, me, guys- follow me in all, all places, all categories. <laughs> you will definitely not have a hard time finding her. Just put her name into Google and you will find her for sure. Um, uh, I'm at Phil, P-H-I-L underscore Boutte, B-O-U-T-T-E um, on Instagram and P Boutte on Twitter. Um, and also you can follow us on designinghollywoodpodcast.com, um, where you can go and check this out. Um, and also I want to thank our sponsor for this episode, which was Western Costume Company, a one-stop shop for costume designers, costumers, and stylists. Since the early days of Hollywood over a century ago, Western Costume has been an industry mainstay and Western Costume has got you covered. It's hard to read that because I'm so, like, I love Western Costume so much in terms like, it's like where I've been my entire career, um, in the sense that. Uh, it just feels like such a familiar place. It's much more than any of those words could actually say. So if you have a chance to, if you're visiting, go visit Western Costume. It's amazing. Maybe not pandemic-wise now, because there's like lots of rules and stuff with masks and things, but it's an awesome place. So thank you, Western Costume. I want to thank the Designing Hollywood podcast team. Um, I want to thank Janie Bryant again for joining us. Um, And I want to thank producer and founder Martika Abera and co-founder costume designer Marilyn Vance for putting this show on. Um, And thank you to all our viewers for tuning in. This was a great episode and I thank Janie for joining us and I hope you guys are all inspired and that you stay focused. Thank you so much. Love you, Philip. Thank you too. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you to our sponsor, Western Costume Company. More than a century old, Western Costume Company is the oldest and largest costume house in America. A one shop for all your costuming needs.